How's it going, everybody? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys uh, having me out to talk a little bit about uh, white labeling. So uh, my name is Jesus Burrola. I'm the CEO for a company called Possible. We are uh, 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 operate a 12-acre farm where we grow and co-package for a lot of the largest brands out in California. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about what the asset light uh, model looks like and why white label could be a great solution for a lot of you folks looking to start a brand. So just, just show of hands, are a lot of, is there a lot of people that are looking to start a cannabis brand in here? Yeah? Okay. Awesome. So, um, so I think before talking about cannabis, it's talking about CPG in general. So uh, what if cannabis is not that different than traditional CPG? And so what I mean with this is when you think about successful CPG companies, um, you think about all the big brands, and so uh, let's just take Coca-Cola, for example. So uh, a lot of people uh, may or may not know this, but you, know, you think of Coca-Cola and you think, man, they probably uh, run and cultivate a bunch of sugar cane fields, uh, corn fields to, for the corn sugar that they put in the drinks, and, and everything else. And the reality is that when you actually look at how Coca-Cola runs the business, not only are they not producing the corn, they're not operating sugar cane fields, they're actually not bottling it themselves, they're actually not distributing it themselves. Um, they have over 200 partners all across the world in 900 different bottling plants all throughout the world. Like, why are they doing that? They're Coca-Cola. They have billions and billions of dollars. Like, aren't they focused on just making sure that they can bring their production cost and squeeze every penny and plant sugar canes and keep all the margin in the farm and then keep all the margin in the drink? And like, um, you know, and you think about it, it's like maybe Coca-Cola's wrong, man. Maybe they're just not maximizing uh, what they're doing with their business. But then you see a bunch of different companies that are also traditional CPG, and that model is more common than what most people understand. So, um, you know, just to talk about a couple of the logos on the screen, you have uh, MGP. Anybody heard about that brand or what that is? That's probably like uh, one of the most surprising names for me on that list. So, because you would say, well, cannabis is craft. Cannabis is special. Like, how you cultivate it matters. And People are going to look for a specific cultivator in cannabis with a specific strain. And a lot of that is true. Uh, so MGP is a company that manufactures over 100 craft liquor brands. So brands that uh, anybody here is big on bourbon or whiskey? I, 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 like, I like bourbon. So uh, Whistle Pig, super craft, uh, super craft bourbon bottle. Goes for like you know, up to 150 bucks for like their nice stuff. Award winner, everything else. And so you'd say, hey man, this is a very successful craft bourbon brand. It's not made by them. It's made by M MGP. And so are like 50 other brands that, uh, that, that you would tell on the shelf. So Anheuser-Busch, same concept. Uh, you know, biggest producer of beer in the United States, you would think they're they're growing barley, they're growing oats, they're growing all the components going into beer, and the answer is that they operate zero cultivation on their own. They have partners that are growing all those stuff, all those things, and they're buying from farmers to, to put those things into the beer. Malboro, same thing. So you could go on and off. Tyson Chicken sells more chickens than anybody else in the United States. They don't operate any chicken farms. Um, you even see a logo there, uh, Foxconn, and like, I didn't even know what that was. They're actually the people that manufacture your iPhones, right? So it's not Apple. Apple doesn't run uh, manufacturing plants overseas. They have somebody that does that for them. So but, but why not? Why do they do that? It's Apple. They have millions of dollars. It's Tyson Chicken. They, they have millions of dollars. So um, why are they not taking con complete control of their supply chain? Why are they not trying to bring those costs down as much as they can? And so uh, what I would say is those companies really understand what their core value is. Um, 
Apple is not a manufacturing company. Apple is a company that designs and creates great product, right? Um, so they're focused in trying to make sure that they, they do what they do best. And so, uh, you know, Anheuser-Busch is probably not going to be the best farmer or the best agriculture, so why would they want to get into that business? Uh, it's hard to operate w many businesses at the same time. So in cannabis, we've seen it, and we're actually starting to see the opposite now. It started with, a, you know, in California, a huge influx of money and everybody saying, we're going to be a vertically integrated company. We're going to start a cultivation. We're going to have our own brand. We're going to buy retail. We're going to do our own distribution in-house. We're going to have a sales team. All those things take a lot of money, and that is... But getting good at any of those things is hard enough. So when you try to be good at six things at the same time, it, it, it's not one startup. It's six startups in what is a very difficult environment to operate in. So that's why you now see a lot of those vertical integrated companies in California where, you know, that raise hundreds of millions of dollars now starting to sell off assets. You saw that in Canada as well. Uh, it, it, it is, in my opinion, not, not the best way to go about it. It, it, it is not the way to be most, most capital uh, efficient, especially in an industry where raising capital or having access to capital is so, so difficult to do, right? So... Um, if at the end of the day, what you are looking to do is have a cannabis brand, do you really want to start learning what agriculture is about? Do you really want to invest, you know, uh, millions and millions of dollars to have an indoor cultivation facility? Then you then have to run every day, right? Which will take you away from going out and actually growing your brand on the street. So, um, uh, the second thing is that the economies of scale matter. So when you are trying to do multiple things at the same time, it's hard to dedicate the capital that any one of those requires. So uh, we've seen it. Growing a brand is expensive. Uh, the marketing outreach that needs to happen, the things that dispensaries will be asking for uh, from folks to carry, the giveaways, the sampling, uh, Everything that has to happen, building a website, build, you know, doing the next drop, it all is going to require capital. So, um, and doing things, um, you know, if I have a 10,000 square foot farm, am I going to be the most efficient operator at that scale when you have people that are going to be growing in 200, 300? I mean, there's a cultivator in California that says they want to have 5.5 million square feet of cultivation. Think about that. So uh, what is going to be a more efficient way uh, to source that flour? Today in California, you can buy actually flour in the bulk market cheaper than what it costs those companies to grow it, right? And so by being able to do it at scale, it's easier to go deeper into one thing. I'm a cultivator, and I'm developing a large project with a lot of square feet, but I supply 20 brands, and so all those brands capture the economies of scale that I'm able to bring because I can assure myself through at the end of the day through working with all those partners. Um, you can build resiliency. So, like I said, today the price in California has dropped tremendously, and if you're a cultivator and maybe one that didn't have scale and maybe one that was still learning everything about ag, you're going to have a lot of costs tied to that. So it, in an essence, the, what the white label model allows you to do is to just be flexible, right? Maybe you change the input that you put. Maybe you go to a different farm. Maybe you, you just, all you have to do if, if you're going through white labeling and, and, and working in that asset light model is basically just buy less wheat or negotiate a better price. When you are running a vertic vertically integrated company, you don't have that luxury, right? So uh, you're able to match what your actual sell-through is versus how much you're buying. If you, 
if you launch a cultivation effort, you really can't do that, right? Like, and you're always going, like, maintaining that balance between what you're growing versus what you're selling is extremely critical, in, especially in a world where, you know, as this market matures, you're going to see, you know, bulk prices come down. Initially, sure, uh, everybody's got, you know, everybody has, like, a lot of price built into their models, but, you know, this industry will bring competition and it will bring large players. And so you don't want to be at a disadvantage. Um, I think another advantage of this is being able to enter multiple markets. So if Coca-Cola wants to start selling in India, they don't have to figure out where am I going to buy a plant? Who's going to staff the plant? How does it work in India with the government? All they have to do is basically find somebody that wants to do it for them. And this same concept applies to, you know, to cannabis. I would actually say that the advantages of being an asset light white labeler are larger in cannabis than in traditional CPG. So first and foremost is licensing. Everybody here is talking about, hey, apply for a license. I'm going to get a license. I'm working on getting a license. What if I told you that out of the 20 plus brands that I work with in California, less than three actually have a license, right? Like they completely circumvented the licensing process and actually that speed to market got them out there quicker and at, a, at lower cost. So at least in California, if you want to get a license, they're going to say, okay, show me that you have a property Show me your security, that you have 24-7 security on there. Show me this. Show me that it's insured. All those costs add up. If you want to run an asset light brand, you don't have to do any of those things, right? And I'll, and I'll show you how in a little bit. Um, you get to avoid the learning curve of being a grower and co-packager. So we've been growing for four years in, uh, in my farm, and we have been through the gamut of issues, whether it's plants that herm and get seeded, whether it's, you know, failing for some kind of COA test because we used the wrong, um, you know, fertilizer for the plants, or uh, we, we screwed something out in our drying process, or we over-irrigate it, like, and all those mistakes cost a lot of money. So uh, when you really have to maximize capital, it is, a, it is a very good way because you're, you know exactly what you're getting and what you're paying for. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we work with about 20 partners in California. There's a huge success story at one of the partners that I, that, that, and brands that we work with. Uh, they're a brand that's positioned top five in, in one of the larger categories and pre-rolls. They run that company with four people. Right? Why? Because they figured out a way that, hey, I can outsource my production to you and your, my co-packaging to you. And so that reduces a lot of overhead. They've partnered with a company that helps them sell the product. They've partnered with a distributor that can help place that product all throughout the state. So all they're really focused on is the brand messaging, the brand story, creating great content, and really getting more people out the door. So... Um, Another advantage is that you can work with multiple SKUs. So if I just had to worry about, you know, my brand, I would be limited to the things that I could do in my farm. Um, so I would probably not buy a gummies machine or I wouldn't buy an extraction machine. All those things add money. So, but what you are able to do is once you learn to work through this asset light white label model, it's easy to say, okay, well, now I have a flower that's figured out, like, I want to launch a vape. So who are the folks that are white labeling vape? And who are the folks that are manufacturing gummies? And like being able to create that whole spectrum of products and, and having a complete line is a very good way to maximize your revenue because you're not having to fund another website, another uh, Instagram account, another branding pitch book, you basically get to leverage the things that you've already invested money in. So a uh, huge issue with cannabis is really 
that dilemma of scale, which is, um, let's just say for packaging flour, the equipment, uh, if you're going to do it in scale, you need equipment. That equipment is expensive. And let's just say you want to run a 10,000 square foot farm. Um, you're not going to have enough product there to keep a machine doing pre-rolls 24-7, 365, which is how you would maximize the value. You'd say, I'm going to spend this money for this automation machine, and then I'm going to run it one day a month, right? So you're tying up your capital on things that you're not really going to get to maximize. So um, that is always the dilemma. Is, um, and another thing that I've seen is just a lot of my brand partners are now in five or six or seven different states because they're basically doing the same thing they did and they learned how to do in California in other places. So, look, even today, if you had wanted to launch a brand today and you're waiting for a license in New York and you want to get your cultivation asset up and running before you launch a brand, you could literally make a phone call tomorrow and, like, there are a bunch of places that would grow and co-package for you in California, right? You could, you could launch a branch of brand in California in like 30 days. But all we really need from our partners is packaging. Um, so how do I launch a brand? And, and really, that comes down to understanding the supply chain and cannabis. So, um, you know, going from genetics to a nursery to cultivation to somebody that processes that flour, somebody that distributes it and get it, gets it to the final chain. So, you know, how many of those things do you want to do yourself or how many of those things are you going to need a partner for, right? Do you want to be sourcing genetics yourself? Like, do you want to run your own nursery? Do mom, moms and clones, do you want to grow your own flour? Do you want to process in-house or do you want to send it to somebody? And look, here's what the landscape really looks like. And I would even say this partnership could be at, as easy as two. You could partner with a grower and send it to a co-packager, which would pick, be picked up by a distributor, which would ultimately get it into a retail store. And obviously you need some kind of sales team to do that, whether you want to have a sales team that you own and you pay and is in your payroll or whether you want to hire one. But, uh, you know, those are just four of the players. Like I said, it actually could be as simple as two. So, for example, in my company, we both grow and co-package for brands. So we're able to take those two steps and combine it into one. And there are distributors that also offer sales services. So distributor and sales can actually be one consolidated channel as well. So you literally could be in business with two, two partners that could cover everything in your supply chain. Um, yeah, so what does that relationship currently look like? Um, you know, how, well, how can I operate a cannabis brand if I don't have a license? And the answer to that is, as a grower and I co-packager, I, I own a license. I would sell it to a distributor who also operates and, and owns a license. And ultimately, they're going to deliver it to retail. So where, do you, where does the brand come in? And the answer to that is the brand is never touching the product, right? The brand is growing the demand for the product. And all I'm really doing is, you know, putting it in the brand's packaging, working off of their SOPs, and basically fulfilling the orders that they've been able to get at the dispensaries, and every dollar that comes back in, there is a revenue split with that brand, right? Um, so ultimately, you know, if you decide to go to that model, you would need to determine what the right uh, grower and co-packager looks like for your business. I would say... Uh, I would advise that a consolidating a grower and a co-packager is something that has a lot of value because you eliminate the finger pointing between the grower and the co-packager when something goes wrong, like, hey, the flower has mold, the flower has uh, seeds, the flower's too dry. You know, there's always going to be that finger pointing of the co-packager going back to the grower or the grower blaming the co-packager. So when you're able to consolidate those, like the folks that work through our company, 
If something's wrong with the flower, they have one phone call to make. That's us, right? Um, second one is like, you need to pick a partner that's going to protect your IP, whether that's your genetic or whether that is a product that you have created that is a little bit differentiated in the market. You, you need somebody that it, you're going to you know, be able to trust with your IP that's going to give you clarity in terms of pricing and volume. You know, we see in California huge, huge spikes of flour in the winter with the winter harvest, but then the summer, you know, typically there is a shortage of flour. So you need partners that are going to have you not just in, you know, when there's a lot of flour around, but also in those months where price goes up and there's less flour available. And, and really, ultimately, somebody who is committed to white labeler. So there are folks that will do it that have their own brand. The, the, the real question is, are they committed to white label? Or is it just a secondary sale with whatever they can't sell on their brand, and then we'll let you pick second? Um, okay, yeah, all right. So uh, co one that covers a range of prod product and one that's well capitalized, and ultimately, you know, what, what would you look for in a distributor? You want to make sure that you understand the pros and cons of a distributor that takes possession of the product and pays for product and what that doesn't. Uh, the ability to service the territory, to give you good data that has a technology stack, and, uh, um, and how strong their sales team is. So, um, and ultimately, uh, you know, if you decide to go uh, forward with looking at this model, what are they going to be looking for you for, right? Um, you know, elephant in the room, this business t is very capital intensive. Yes, they'll probably want to know that, hey, um, is this brand going to make it? Do they have either the capital or the ability to raise capital to be able to, like, fund what it's going to take to grow a brand? Um, clear specs and SOPs, you know, there's nothing better for us as a cultivator than know exactly what our, what our brand partner expects. You want five nugs per jar. You want seven nugs per jar. You want 30% THC. Put it down on paper so that it's not uh, arguing about whether or not it was what you thought you were going to get, right? We want to see exactly what you want. We can price you accordingly and make sure that you get that in the jar. Um, functionality of packaging, I think that this is a big one for folks that build products. There's a lot of great-looking skinny cones that... You know, folks that have a marketing eye will say, oh, man, I, I really want to do this pre-roll. It looks so cool. It could be a complete nightmare. We, you know, uh, we have only parted ways with one brand in our entire history that has ever left, you know, that we've ever parted ways. And really, it was based on their packaging. It was so hard to package that product that we literally couldn't do it at scale or make any money. And so as you look at the components of the brand, just keep in mind you know, packaging could have a huge component on price. And, um, and lastly, is there a true commitment and passion for the business? You know, I sometimes get calls from folks saying, hey, um, I want to start a side business and just have a brand off to the side and, you know, I'll dedicate a little bit of time. Look, cannabis is a plant that we all love and, that, and in a business that we're all looking to participate in. There's a lot of very smart, capable folks that have a true passion for it. So, but to put yourself in a situation with somebody that is not going to be able to dedicate time to that brand or, or like, be as dedicated as the brands that they're going to compete with the market, you know, would be a complete disadvantage. So we, we typically only will work with somebody that we know this is their mission. They're trying to build a cannabis brand. It's not a side project. So um, that's it for me. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. All right, guys. Like I said, I think this is one of the most important business models for people. Do what you do well. Jesus broke it down.